six unsolved murder cases that will keep you up at night. Any unsolved crime is interesting in its own right, but certain cases go beyond the scope of traditional mysteries and enter the world of the bizarre. I'm not talking about crimes that are merely strange, I'm talking about crimes that are eerie. The kind of crimes that could keep an armchair detective up all night, preoccupied with finding a solution to the mystery. Have you ever heard about monster murders? Hey folks, welcome back to Crime Point, where today, in this video, we are going to find out about the most unsolved murder cases ever. Let us dive right in. And before we do that, make sure you subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon so you never miss out on any of our amazing videos. And let's begin! Who placed Bella at the bottom of the White Elm? If you are traveling from the city center of Birmingham to Wolferton to Shropshire and are traveling on the A46, which is Hagley Road, you'll pass the boundary of Hagley Wood. When viewed from the road, it appears to be dangerous. It's not difficult to imagine a gothic heroine suffocating in the gloom of the trees as night comes, especially if the atmosphere is foggy and sinister. It is only natural that it would be the site of a mystery that has persisted since the 1940s. On April 18, 1943, three young boys were out searching for bird nests when they came across an alluring white elm tree, which is one of the most frequent kinds of the European elm tree. As one of the boys climbed the tree, he looked down through a knot hole and saw what appeared to be human teeth and what appeared to be human hair attached to what appeared to be a skull. The vast trunk of the tree was practically hollow. The tree had been used to conceal the body of another person. Springfield's Three The third installment of Springfield The Springfield, Missouri news leader forecast partly cloudy skies and lows in the 60s on June 6, 1992. Suzanne Streeter and Stacy McCall had just graduated from high school and had been at a party until just after 2 a.m. when they left for Suzanne's home on 1717 East Delmar. Stacy, Suzanne, and Cheryl Levitt, Suzanne's mother, were never seen again. One person's disappearance could have been planned. Maybe they just wanted to start over. The disappearance of two teenage girls and one of the girls' mothers is clearly something else entirely. It was obvious from the start that whatever happened, happened quickly. There were no signs of struggle, but everything someone might have taken with them remained. Purses, clothes, cars, cigarettes, and Levitt and Streeter's dog. The Child Murderer in Oakland County The child killer or killers of Mark Stebbins, Jill Robinson, Christine Milik, and Timothy King may have been identified. While there are few similarities between this unsolved series of murders that occurred between February 1976 and March 1977 and the infamous Zodiac murders, there were several suspects over time. There were known pedophiles among them, as well as a mysterious male couple in which the sub claimed his dom committed the crimes and John Wayne Gacy. Chris Bush, a strong suspect, committed suicide in 1978, and no murders matching the Oakland County profile occurred again. However, the case remains unsolved. The Axe Murders in Villisca Bill James and his daughter Rachel McCarthy James released The Man from the Train in 2017. The Jameses claim to have solved the murders of the Moore family and two guests in Villisca, Iowa on June 10, 1912. They identified a man named Paul Mueller and presented evidence that Mueller had killed up to 100 people across the United States and into Canada. While the authors made a compelling case, the truth is that the case will never be solved after 106 years. The Moore murders are horrific and strange, made even stranger by their location a sleepy town in the southwest corner of Iowa with a population of just over 1,100 people. Josiah Moore, age 43, his wife Sarah, and their children Herman, Mary Catherine, Arthur, and Paul returned home from Children's Day events at their church on June 9th. They were accompanied by Mary Catherine's friends Ina May and Lena Stillinger. Someone was waiting for the group in the Moore Homes attic at 508 East 2nd Street. While he waited, he smoked a couple cigarettes. He then killed everyone in the house with Josiah's own axe between midnight and 5 a.m. He used the blunt edge on everyone except Josiah, who took the most blows. Murders in the Moonlight in Texarkana Long before the Zodiac Killer, another unnamed psychopath preyed on couples parking in remote areas of Texarkana, a city on the Arkansas-Texas border. Five people were killed over the course of ten weeks. Some of the women were raped, and one man was beaten. They were all shot. The murders then simply stopped. Three more people were saved from the Phantom Killer's attacks. The killer was described as wearing a white mask with holes cut for his eyes. Over the years, a compelling case has been made that the murderer was a convicted fella named U.L. Swinney. His wife even claimed he did it, only to later retract her claim. Swinney died in 1994, leaving behind whatever secrets he had. 
Artis Perry's assassination. Artis Perry was 19 years old and married to Bruce Perry, whom she met in high school, on that autumn night in Palo Alto. Artis was a receptionist, and Bruce was a sophomore at Stanford. The story of that night, October 12, 1974, progresses from strange to surreal. Artis left, saying she wanted to pray alone at Stanford Memorial Church, according to Bruce. A worried Bruce called the police in the middle of the night to report that Artis hadn't returned home and to tell them where she was. When they checked, the church was locked and everything appeared to be in order. A security guard entered the church a few hours later and discovered Artis on the floor near the altar. She was lying on her back with a five-inch long ice pick protruding from her head. She had been strangled to death. A large candle was placed on her chest. She was naked from the waist down, with a second candle inserted into her vagina. Blair Adams If you watched Unsolved Mysteries in the 1990s, you may be familiar with Blair Adams' Unsolved Murder. It's extremely difficult to forget. Blair was discovered dead in a hotel parking lot in Knoxville, Tennessee on July 11, 1996. Around him was nearly $4,000 in cash flapping and flying. It was an odd mix of currencies, Canadian bills, U.S. dollars, and German Deutschmarks. On July 5th, he withdrew the funds from his bank and added expensive jewelry to the mix. He then attempted to enter America, but was stopped because that much cash spelled drug mule to Border Patrol. He rerouted and purchased a plane ticket to Germany, which he never used. Instead, Blair attempted another border crossing and was successful in entering Seattle. Blair was murdered sometime around 3 a.m., possibly with a club. Something powerful enough to kill. Murders on Snapchat on February 13, 2017, Liberty, Libby German, age 14, and her 13-year-old friend Abigail Williams photographed and recorded their killer's voice. Despite this, the double homicide in Delphi, Indiana remains unsolved after this time. The girls were walking along the Delphi Historic Trails doing what 8th graders do, taking pictures and posting them on social media. They must have noticed a large man nearby at some point. Libby had the foresight to photograph him. His head was bowed, he wore a cap, and he walked with his hands in his pockets. The Florence Monster Someone murdered at least 14 people in and around Florence, Italy between the late 1960s and 1985. The case is well known, in part because of its similarities to the Zodiac murders in Northern California in 1968 and 69. Il Mostro, as the Italians called him, preyed on couples who parked in lover's lanes. He murdered with a 22 and a knife, adding a gruesome signature of cutting off parts of the women he killed as souvenirs. He may have stalked some of the victims prior to the murders and taunted their families afterward. The police had no shortage of suspects, with the most notable being convicted murderer and peeping Tom, Pietro Pacciani. In fact, Pacciani was tried and convicted for Il Mostro's crimes, only to have the conviction overturned. Then Pacciani's friends, Mario Vanni and Giancarlo Lodi, were convicted and imprisoned for the murders, but few Italians believe they collaborated on the crimes. The Phantom of the Freeway Racism could be one of the main reasons you haven't heard of the Freeway Phantom, a truly creepy killer who forced a victim to write a taunting note to the police. The Phantom murdered many young African-American women in and around Washington, D.C. between 1971 and 1972. They range in age from 10 to 18 years. Some people were sexually abused. Carol Spinks, age 13, started his spree in April of 1971. She vanished as she walked home from the grocery store. Her body was discovered in the grass near I-295 almost a week later. The killer then abducted Darlenia Johnson, age 16, in July. She was in prison for a little more than two weeks before the phantom dumped her body just feet away from where Carol Spinks was discovered. Brenda Crockett, age 10, was the next victim. She called home crying a few hours after she vanished. She said a white man had picked her up and she was on her way home, then abruptly ended the call with bye. Brenda called back saying she was in a house and was yanked off the phone once more. Unlike the others, she was not restrained. The killer raped and strangled the girl to death before abandoning her along a Maryland highway. Next up was Namomoshia Yates. She was only 12 years old when she was found beside the road, almost identical to Brenda Crockett. Following Nina Moshia's murder, the killer earned the moniker Freeway Phantom. The Phantom wasn't finished yet. And that brings us to the end of today's video. Feel free to let us know what you think about it. And if you like the video, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel for more great videos. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you 